I'm Philip A. Sharp, uh, Institute Professor at MIT in the uh, Koch Institute for Integrated Cancer Research. I want to talk about RNA splicing and the discovery of split genes, but I want to set it in the context of the question of what is a gene. Because we use the word gene when we talk to each other, but when we start thinking about it in the context of specific biochemical structure, the genes are very complicated, and we really find it very difficult to define a gene, and this can be quite important in terms of understanding biology. Many years ago, when I began in uh, molecular and cell biology, the gene was really quite simple. Uh, and it's illustrated here by a diagram from Jacobin Minot, which was published in 1961 illustrating the LAC operon and the, nat the structure of the genes in the LAC operon and the messenger RNA that comes from those genes. And then the proteins you see at the bottom of this illustration of uh, galactosidase permease and others that are encoded by that messenger RNA. And in 1961, this explained what a gene was. A gene was like Z in that diagram, a linear sequence encoding uh, and transferring information into an RNA in a linear fashion, and then a protein being coded from it. And we even understood in this year, 1961, that there were sequences nearby, operons, that were cis to the gene that were critical for the expression of a gene. So in the early, uh, late 60s, early 70s, when I entered cell biology, everyone suspected that they understood a gene to the point that Minot actually made the statement that what is true of bacteria is true of an elephant. Well, by and large, that is the case, but an elephant's a little bit more complex than bacteria, as we will see. Cell biologists have long suspected, even in the early 70s, that genes in mammalian cells were somewhat more complicated. Maybe there were mysteries here. And this influenced my own thinking as I moved to Cold Spring Harbor to begin to uh, study animal viruses. And some of the hints that there might be a difference in the genetic structure in mammalian cells or cells with nuclei was uh, two general facts. One is, if you look at uh, the nucleus of a cell, you see the out, outline of the nucleus. This is the nucleolus. We knew that in the nucleus of a mammalian cell, there was a thousand-fold higher levels of, of DNA. It was a thousandfold more complex than in bacteria. But it didn't seem that mammalian cells would need a thousandfold more genes. So we had a lot more DNA in the nucleus of the cell than we suspected we needed for genes. And then another issue was that when we metabolically labeled RNA in the nucleus of a cell, it was much larger than the RNA that we found in the cytoplasm of the cell. Uh, and there was this dichotomy. It was larger by a factor of five than the, the size of the message in the cytoplasm. So there was this paradox. Long nuclear RNA, smaller cytoplasmic RNA. The long nuclear RNA had a cap at the five prime end, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Had poly A at the three prime end, yet it was longer, and the message had the same modifications, and it was shorter. So it... In 1971, I moved to Cold Spring Harbor to start uh, learning how to work with, ad with animal viruses, and particularly animal viruses, DNA viruses, that cause cancer in animals. And one of the viruses that we worked with was adenovirus 2. This is a micrograph of adenovirus 2. It's got a, a beautiful virus with capsid proteins, primarily of the hexon protein that constitute most of this capsid. It has its fibers at the end that um, you see here that are to attach to cells. It's long enough as a genome to have 35 genes encoded. So it was a, a wonderful virus to work with to probe the cell biology of cells, as well as to study the, its ability to cause cancer in animals. So we started in 1970 at Cold Spring Harbor determining the structure of the genome of adenovirus. And that led us to the development of restriction in the nuclease maps. And this was, these are two examples of a restriction in the nuclease map of the adenovirus genome. 
One is the eco R1 here at the top, and the other is the HIMD3 at the bottom. So we mapped the cleavage sites of these restriction enzymes across the genome, and therefore were able to start preparing a map of the relationship of RNA to, gene, uh, to genome structure. And I want you to recall two restriction fragments. One is this HIMD3 fragment, A fragment here, and another is this eco R1 fragment right there. And this hexon messenger RNA. We knew that the messenger RNA mapped across the genome in this position. And we wanted to compare the structure of the messenger RNA for this hexon, hexon protein, to the nuclear RNA that was expressed in the nucleus of a cell. And we were going to do this by electron microscopy, which I had learned at Cold Spring Harbor when I, I mean at uh, Caltech when I was a postdoc with Norman Davison. So when we did that, and we in this case is uh, Sue Burgett and Claire Moore, uh, Sue a postdoc, Claire a technician in the lab, uh, and we did an R loop mapping between the, the messenger RNA for hexon and the genome, what we observed is shown in these series of diagrams. What is shown all the way over here to the right is the, the Hindi 3A fragment in total, and then this is a blow up of the piece of that. R loop. And what you see here is this section of the electron micrograph is the RNA DNA hybrid. And what was puzzling to us was here a little tail at the three prime end of the message. And what was really puzzling was this little tail at the five prime end of the message. Now, the three prime end tail, we understood that was the poly A track. But there shouldn't have been a tail at the five prime end of the message. It should have annealed to the DNA sequences. And we spent a large amount of time trying to do controls to show that that tail really didn't come from the DNA sequences. And therefore, that led us to the question of, well, where did these sequences come from? And I ask you to remember the eco R1 fragment because that allowed us to do a very direct experiment to test whether the upstream sequences uh, in the adenovirus genome had the sequences to this tail. And what we observed when we made the RNA-DNA hybrid between the long fragment and the message for the hexon is illustrated here. This uh, shows you a diagram of it here. This is the actual micrograph there. And what is striking about this micrograph, if you look in this region, is there are three loops. And that immediately told us that that tail had sequences from three different regions of the adenovirus genome. And we show it here in the diagram of A loop, B loop, and C loop. And that told us that the RNA for this hexon message was actually being joined together out of four segments. And it's diagrammed here in this diagram of the RNA-DNA hybrid. You see the hexon RNA message, and that was the end of that electron micrograph. You see the C loop the B loop and the A loop being created by the annealing of these sequences off in the genome here, A, B, and C prime, to the hexon message down here. And that immediately told us that this RNA for the hexon message was actually coming from a long RNA that was being transcribed from A, B, and C all the way through the genome and then splice together to make these three segments to the body of the message. So that told us that the secret between the long nuclear RNA and the shorter cytoplasmic RNA was this process of RNA splicing, the removal of sequences from the middle of the messenger RNA, a suggestion no one had made before. And it told us, more generally, that all the genes, or most of the genes, in these complex mammalian cells, are expressed by this process of RNA splicing. So in 1977, when this work was uh, announced and published, uh, we created this diagram that illustrates, in the same way that Jacob and Mano did, the flow of information from DNA into the messenger RNA, but in this case, in mammalian cells as contrasted to bacterial cells. And what you see here, then, is the promoter where the RNA is initiated, the cap is synthesized, and from the work of Aaron Schachten and Bernie Voss, we knew 
a great deal about the chem chemistry of the cap. And then over here where there was poly A cleavage, cutting of the RNA at a poly A site and a poly A added, making a precursor RNA that then is spliced before the RNA is transported to the cytoplasm here. So we diagram then the flow of information from DNA into messenger RNA in mammalian cells. Now this diagram is a little simplified because most, messenger, most genes in mammalian cells have 10 different introns, not just one, and therefore there's much more splicing. And in many cases that splicing is nascent, why the RNA is being synthesized from the DNA doesn't occur in a polydentylated precursor, but in about one in 10 cases, one in 10 introns, it is removed uh, post-transcriptionally with this poly A adenylated precursor RNA. So we outlined the pathway in the synthesis of messenger RNA in higher cells, and we knew those cells had a much more complex structure. Now, just for completeness, and because no one else is interested in nanovirus anymore, just let me illustrate the complexity by which a virus uses this process of RNA splicing to express itself. You see, as we said before, there are three different leaders, exons, A, B, and C, we saw in the previous diagram. And those are spliced to all of these messenger RNAs across the genome. So there's a long RNA made from the left end of the genome across the genome, and all of these sets of RNAs are processed from it. And for example, this is a polydentylation site where the hexon message is actually produced by splicing. And this is another polydentylation site where another major messenger RNA is used. Each of these involves a long precursor across the whole genome, alternative polydentylation at different sites, the splicing of those three leaders to the end of the message. But when we look at the other transcriptional units in the virus, here's one that's the E4, E3, E2, and E1 on the left side over here, you see again very complex splicing of alternative polydentylation and alternative splicing accounting for the complexity of the message from this adenovirus genome. This has led us to think about what is actually a gene. And when you start thinking about a gene, then you ask yourself, What's the unit of information in a gene that actually accounts for the uh, per, uh, functional unit of a gene? So this is my favorite gene. This is from Larry Zabersky, who's at UCLA. It's the Dascom gene. It's expressed in the nervous system of Drosophila. And it produces 38,000 different proteins from one gene. Now, each of these little bars here, this is the genomic DNA diagram. Each of these little bars here is, a, is an exon. And what you note here is that there are something like 33 different exons. And you can alternatively splice one of these into each precursor messenger RNA. And this is 48 different exons for exon 6 and 12 for exon 4. And these are all used in permutation, producing 38,000 different messenger RNAs and different proteins. So when we talk about this gene, is it one of those exons being spliced to another to make one functional unit that goes into a protein? Or is it the whole transcriptional unit and all 38,000 different proteins, different functions within a gene? And each of those exons could potentially be a gene. So this leads us to the question that the cellular environment can modify the nature of the messenger RNA in the transfer of information from DNA to protein. In one cell, the DNA sequence is interpreted one way. In another cell, it's interpreted another way through alternative splicing and alternative polydentylation and something I haven't spoken about, RNA editing. So a given genomic sequence is actually not a faithful representation of the functional information expressed from a gene. And therefore, as we look at our genome, and now we have the genome sequence that was published in 2003, 50 years after Watson and Crick, and we say to each other, we have 23,000 genes, but we do have 23,000 transcription units, 
which for example accounts for where the transcription begins on the left side of this diagram and moves to the right. But you see alternative promoters, alternative polyvinylation sites, alternative splicing in the middle of the gene here. And you see in some cells you would use this information in the gene, and in other cells by alternative splicing you would skip that information. So what's a gene? It's a, it's a very difficult question to answer when we get to the level of biochemistry or looking at functional units in a genetic transmission sort of thing. We use the term gene among ourselves all the time, but when we start specifically probing a gene, a gene is actually a very difficult thing to define. So I want to thank you for your attention and uh, listening to this discussion of what is a gene.